So earlier this week, uh, or I guess last week, depending on how you look at your weeks, uh, last week I was in the final stages of finishing up this sermon and uh, just kind of putting some final touches on it, and, and something happened. And uh, I had to kind of walk away from something that I had committed a lot of time in, a lot of energy, and a lot of passion, something I became very passionate about. I had to walk away from it. And it was really, really difficult. And I'm not going to lie to you, it, it took me probably several days to fully kind of get over it. And of course, I'm writing this sermon about being blessed and having a blessed life, and everything's great, and God is good, and I'm dealing with this issue. And for some, it might be a minor issue. For me, it was a, it was a big deal. So I'm dealing with this issue, and then Wednesday morning, so this happened on Tuesday evening, Wednesday morning, I try to go back to this habit that I started developing at the beginning of this year, which was uh, praying through the Psalms. So the idea with the praying through the Psalms is you basically look at five Psalms per day based on the day of the week, and then you, you once one of those kind of resonates with you, you start praying through that Psalm, and you start to go through your prayer list using that Psalm as a guide. So I came across Psalm chapter 9. The, the very first psalm in that, in that plan, in Psalm chapter 9, verse 1, says this. It says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, and I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. That was a punch in the gut if I ever saw one. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. So immediately, I'm like, okay, God, I got to get over this. I got to get through this, and I got to move forward. And really, that's what we're going to see this morning, because we all know difficulties, problems, hurt, pain, suffering, all those things we know is a part of life. As I look around this room, I know many of you are dealing with that in this very moment. We all know that that's the case. So there's really two things we can do. We can sulk in it, or we can recount all of his wonderful deeds. And we can effectively, from that, we are able to move on a little bit. And it's so much easier to say than it is to do. And I know that. Later in that same psalm, in in, in Psalm chapter 9, and later David writes about his enemies stumbling. How his enemies are stumbling before God as they walk down their own path. And isn't it curious that that came up as we're we're reading these psalms of ascents. And in, in these psalms of ascents, we all know and we've seen already in these past several weeks that these are all psalms about this walk. These are all psalms about this journey that the Israelites were taking. From them, it was a very literal journey that they were taking to to Israel uh, for the feasts. But for us, it's a little bit different, obviously. And all of them so far that we've seen, I think it's pretty evident that it talks about the difficulties during that walk, and it also talks about the blessings and the joys from that walk. So, of course, we're coming to this psalm this morning, Psalm 128, and it's no different. We're going to see that very clearly as we do that. And as, as we'll see, hopefully very clearly this morning, just from the text alone, it's very clear that there is one direction that we need to be heading in. There's one direction that we need to be heading in. And so let's take a look at Psalm 128, see what the psalmist has to say about this. Verse 1, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat of the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it w- shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all of the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. So a couple weeks ago, we looked at uh, Psalm 127. And you might recall we paired that with 122. And as I look back, I'm like, man, I wish I should have paired 127 with this one. And there's a few reasons for that, but one of them is they're, they're kind of a, two of the same kind. They're, they're called wisdom psalms. And these wisdom psalms, as, as pointed out from the title, means they're part of wisdom literature. Wisdom literature in, in the scriptures kind of is its own genre. And when you're looking at wisdom literature... And we're looking at that genre, you kind of have to study it and approach it a little differently than you do some of the other parts of Scripture. There's a certain interpretive journey that you go through to interpret those Scriptures. And we're probably most familiar with uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes as two of the the wisdom-type literatures and books that are within the Bible. And in wisdom sayings and wisdom uh, books, these sayings are in this genre, they're not always prescriptive. 
They're not always prescriptive. Rather, they suggest possible or probable outcomes based on possible and potential choices that we make. So this is one of those things that's kind of a conditional type situation that we'll see here in this psalm. So in other words, a psalm like this one, 128, must be viewed as general statements, not exactly as a promise to us. And I think if we, again, look at our own lives, we can see that as an actual thing. We, we see that as a truth when we look at our own lives and, and some of the hardships that we face. This psalm, like 127, for example, speaks about children. It speaks about family. And it does that a lot in some of these psalms. So if you don't have a husband or a wife, if you don't have children, does that mean you're not blessed by God? Of course not. Of course that's not what that means. It simply means that God is determined to bless you in, in a different way and in a different manner. And, and we see that frequently here. And I think it's, it's a critical to our understanding of this psalm and it, as we approach this psalm, and I think that's why it's critical when we see it this way. And, and again, what we all see is how we choose to act on the blessings that God provides really does determine how blessed we feel. Now, if you've been with this church for any moment in time, you don't, we, we don't talk about feelings very often. And the reason I use that specific word is because there's actually two words for blessed in this psalm. When we're reading it in the English, they almost look like identical phrases. In verses 1 and verses 4 specifically, they look like the same phrase. But these two words are different and they do portray a different sense. So blessed, again, it, it, it looks in, in, in this psalm as, as two different phrases. The first one that we see, which is used in both 1 and 2, that word is a sure. And what it means is it, it really isn't about receiving an award, a reward. It's about a state of bliss, a state of being. So that one is closely related to how we talk about the idea of the, the Hebrew idea of peace. So that first word that we see here speaks more specifically about a feeling and a state of mind that we have. It, it's, it describes the inner character of the individual, the inner character of the person. And, it's, it, and that specific word, when you look at that word in the scriptures, it's never used about God. Rather, it's used about the individual and the blessings that that individual has received. So a real simple translation of that is, we can translate that as happy. So we can use happy to describe that first form that we see there of that word blessing. This, in verse 4, the, the word is barak, and that word is used to describe God and his blessings to his people. And that one there is more attached to the idea of grace that we're familiar with. We're more familiar with the idea of grace, and that's God blessing his people, and it's not dependent on what you and I do. It's dependent on what he has done for us. And again, I think that's important because it's foundational to understanding this psalm a little bit better, even though on the surface level for us, it just seems like it's the same word. So this psalm is describing the wisdom, and recall this idea of wisdom. We looked at this last year when we studied some books in Proverbs. Wisdom in the Hebrew sense, is more related to skill than it is to what we understand it to be. And, and that wisdom is what lies in following the Lord, and that's how we can have those blessings and fulfill those blessings that God has given us. So that's kind of the background. I'm hoping that helps us to, to dive into this, this, uh, this psalm. It's an easy psalm this morning from a surface level. It's a very basic outline, so it should be real easy to get through. Uh, so our main idea this morning is this, that walking with the Lord results in a blessed life. Walking in the Lord results in a blessed life. And again, as a wisdom psalm, this is a very general type statement that describes the individual who is walking with the Lord. And the individual who is walking with the Lord is going to make better decisions as they desire to be obedient to him. And that's really what we'll see here, as they desire to be obedient, and that obedience is a response that we give to God because of the gift of salvation that he has given us. So we'll discuss it this way. We're going to discuss how to walk in his ways. So how we walk in his ways, and we're going we're gonna to get to a few points on that, but I, of course, need to kind of talk through a little bit about what that means. Walking in his ways is not a statement that we probably use very often. One commentator put it this way, the image of walking indicates constant devotion and routine obedience to Yahweh over the course of life. So it's a lifelong journey. It's not something that we get to our destination and we're done. 
I think Pat's used this example before. When you graduate and get a degree, you don't just stop learning. You continue to learn over time. And that's really what we should be doing. This implies a lifestyle of walking upright. That's, that's a lifestyle that we are in. I, I was, I've been reading a book called A Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. And it's a small little kind of book, but it's a great read. And I think uh, the, the idea of pursuing holiness and the idea of walking with the Lord are, are very similar. And, and they almost portray the same idea. And just like we talked about last week, there's a foundation that needs to be kind of st- stood upon as we walk through life as Christians. And that's, of course, the word of God. So that's that foundation that we find. And, and, and Bridges uses that example, and he uses the example of Bible memorization and memorizing verses. And he says it this way. He's like, it's, it, Bible memorization is the way we develop conviction by bringing God's word to bear on specific situations that arise in our lives and determining God's will in that situation from the word. Last week, we got the kids back in, and we're talking to them, and, and I told them we're going to go back to our Bible memorization next week. And I asked them, why do we do it? Why do we memorize the Bible? And they had great answers for that. They understood the assignment. They understood why we have to do that because it helps us to remember the things of the Lord and refer and use God's word as that foundational point for our lives. And he says that that once we we understand the scriptures well enough and we, we live our lives in according to the scriptures, he's like, there's some things that are not specifically in the Bible. There's not things that are specifically in the Bible. So we have to kind of look at principles and things like that. And he suggested a handful of questions that we should be asking ourselves as we navigate through this life. And I'm summarizing what he said, and he's like, you know, one of them is, is what I'm about to do helpful? Is it helpful spiritually, mentally, and spiritually, uh, physically? Is it helpful? The second question he says to ask is, am I doing something that's going to bring me under its power? Am I, can I become a slave to this if I pursue this desire? Third thing he says is, is, is what I'm going to do, is it going to hurt other people? Am I, am I going to hurt someone else by doing what I'm doing? And then another one he says here is what I'm going to do, does it glorify God? And all those principles are actually scripturally, and they're all found in various places in, in 1 Corinthians, between chapters 8 and, and 10, I believe it is. All those questions should come up as we're kind of navigating through life based on the scriptures as that foundation. So having that mindset and and this kind of set of of possible questions we can ask ourselves, it helps us to make decisions that are relative of the individual who's walking with the Lord. So how do we do that? So again, we talked about uh, that we're going to talk about how we do walk through the Lord. And there's three things that this psalm helps us to see that. The first thing is that we need to fear the Lord. And I purposely didn't talk about fear earlier because I knew we were going to cover it here in this first point. Fear the Lord. Fear is, is uh, it's an interesting concept. To us, it probably means something very different than what it did for the Hebrew mindset. I'm going to borrow some language and some concepts that Pastor Pat actually used when we went through Proverbs chapter 1 last year to help us to see what this means a little bit more clearly. There's really several meanings for that word fear and the Hebrew mindset. First is this idea of terror that we experience in a frightening situation terror in a frightening situation. Second one would be a respect, a reverence and awe for somebody who's in in power, somebody who's in power or someone's master. And then the third application would be a a reverence or awe that we we feel in the presence of somebody great, right? So that second one's more aligned to respecting somebody. That other one is this reverence and awe because of somebody who's greater than I. So the idea of fear in the Lord is, is really connected to all three of those things, isn't it? It's really connected to all three of those things. And he, he used this quote that the fear of the Lord is the continual awareness that our loving Heavenly Father is watching and evaluating everything we say, think, and do. That really sums up what that fear of the Lord should look like in our lives, knowing that He's God and He knows exactly what's happening. No sin is unnoticed. We can hide it from friends and family, our church family. We can hide it from others, but no sin is unnoticed by God. And, and we have to live with that truth in our minds and in our hearts in order to be rightfully walking with the Lord and fearing him. 
To me, it's like hearing those, those two dreadful words from your dad. I'm disappointed. Pierces the heart. And we don't want to hear those words from our dads. So there's really those kind of two responses that we have to, to fearing the Lord. First, for those who have been saved by the work of Jesus on the cross, our fear should, should lead to us bowing before him. Bowing before him. That's what it, it should lead us to do. And the other one, if you, the alternative, if you have not known the Lord, it's going gonna, it's gonna to result in you running from him and just completely leaving him behind and running from the creator. So in this context, fear of the Lord results in us walking with the Lord, which in turn results in happiness and blessings in our lives. And there's several results. If you think about a healthy, right fear of the Lord, there's several results that come from that. One, it should cause us to be humble and not proud. And if we're fearing the Lord and we understand his blessings come from him, we're not going to be proud of of my personal accomplishments. It's God who's given us those things. It should cause us to listen to him and his wisdom I want to know more. Tell me more. How do I become closer to you? And it should cause us to be obedient to his commands. And this is not just an Old Testament kind of concept. This is not an Old Testament concept. It's something that we see all throughout the scriptures. Paul told the church in Galatia that by, uh, to walk by the Spirit, and he says doing so helps you to not gratify the desires of the flesh. So Paul uses that frequently in his. John, in his first epistle, warns not to walk in darkness, but instead to walk in light, which results in what? Fellowship with the Father. So you see, a healthy fear of the Lord drives us to have the desire to serve him, the desire to follow him, the desire to please him. And that's what that walking in the Lord as a result of fear does. Next thing the psalmist says is we're to enjoy the fruits of our labor to enjoy the fruits of our labor. I mentioned Psalm 127 earlier as a connector to this psalm, and and the reason and where it connects primarily is this idea of the concept of work. And this verse affirms that we're not just working for the sake of making and saving money, but the Lord says here that we should also be enjoying the fruits of that labor. We should be enjoying the fruits of that work. So how do we do that? I think broadly speaking and immediately we have to realize and understand that, that our skills, the gifts that he has given us, the, the, all those things are, are, are from him. We have to acknowledge that what he has provided, those abilities, are a gift from God. And with that gift, he desires that we use those gifts and use those skills to bless others with them. And we talked about that a few weeks ago as well. The psalm speaks so much on these blessings through walking in that path, so we have to recognize that that also is closely related to work. Ecclesiastes talks about that in chapter 5. Starting at verse 18, Solomon says these words, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and to find enjoyment in the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and to rejoice in his toil, this is the gift from God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps them occupied with the joy in his heart. See, God wants us to have fun. God wants us to enjoy life. A lot of people are a stumbling block for a lot of people who don't want to follow Jesus as they think that we're a bunch of boring people. They think that we're just uh, we're, we're handcuffed and tied to these rules and regulations and the do nots. But we are a blessed people, and, and God says, enjoy the blessings that I have given you. So obviously this isn't an application on frivolous spending. Instead, it's a, it's a way for us to outwardly show our appreciation for what the Lord has given us. He says, I've given this to you. If you have more, go have fun. Enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy what you have. The next thing we see here is that we need to count our blessings. If that sounds familiar, good on you. That means you remembered a sermon from a few weeks ago. Let's call back to Psalm 127 once again. The psalmist here speaks to the blessing of work, and he he uses two kind of pictures of that. He says that that, that there's a, a fruitful wife and their children as part of those blessings. 
And I know we talked about that already. There's these two pictures, these two ideas, this, this fruitful vine and these olive shoots. Now, again, those are topics and things that we don't really talk about too much in our life. There's a few applications for the Jews at that time. Culturally, for the Jews, uh, this is a blessing from them because they were blessed with a large family, which we know from their culture it, it is considered a blessing from God to have a large family. To have a large family, it's considered a blessing from God. Nationally, speaking of Israel as a whole, the vine and olives were actually a very important part of their general economic condition. Even in Song of Solomon, a husband's love for his wife is illustrated by the vine and the olive tree. Now tell me the last time, by the way, you heard somebody in a sermon refer back to Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes in the same sermon. It's all throughout the scriptures. James Montgomery Boyce, a great uh, Presbyterian pastor, uh, he says it this way. He says, the interesting thing about these two images, vines and olive plants, is that they're biblical examples of the abundant life. While they were important to the econ- economy, there they were you know, pictures of that, even though they are actually biblical symbols of the abundant life. So he says they're not food staples like wheat or corn where they symbolize a rich blessing. So the psalmist here is almost praying, let your life have the blessings, abundant blessings. And he says, enjoy the fruit of your labor. So you see the psalmist here is saying that the one who fears the Lord will have their blessings with their work and with their families. And of course, again, I mentioned this a moment ago, and I'm going to acknowledge it once again. We're, we're, we, we know that there are some here who don't have children. We know that there are some here who aren't blessed with a, even a spouse, We recognize that. We acknowledge that. And we talked a lot about that in these psalms, about the family and and children and and work. And some of you are in a different season of life now, too, where you're you're retired. Or maybe you're in a voluntary state of mind in state of work. Others are single and unmarried. Others have not had children. Of course, this does not mean you're not blessed. Of course, this does not mean you're not walking in the way of the Lord. That's why we, again, have to understand the wisdom writings. And I want you to think about, if that category is you, I want you to think about all the greats in the New Testament who were not married. John the Baptist, Paul the Apostle, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus himself in Luke chapter 20 and Matthew chapter 22 speaks about when you go to heaven, when you spend eternity with the Father, you're not going to be married. And why is that? Well, we do read in the scriptures, we understand that as a Christian, we are part of the family of God. We're no longer just individual individuals working around and doing it. We are part of the family of God. We're brothers and sisters and him. And we get to enjoy that, and that's the biggest blessing we can have. And we as a church, we are the bride of Christ. I am not wearing a veil, however. As a church, we are the bride of Christ. And as such, we can enjoy his blessings now and where he has placed us now and where he has put us now. So it doesn't matter if we're this or that. Where we are, where God has placed us, that's where we can enjoy his blessings, and that's what he desires from us. Earlier we said these words. We said, walking with the Lord results in a blessed life. Now, some of us here, don't, we don't have a six-figure salary like the UPS drivers apparently Some of us don't have a a big, giant home or a fancy car, but you have Jesus. If you have Jesus, that means you have the biggest of blessings. You have the blessings that these individuals may not have. That's the biggest blessing we can have. So if you fear God, if you're walking with him, you and I are the most blessed people in this room. And that's, that's what God is talking about here in this psalm. And I think we need reminders like that every once in a while, especially when the world is this crazy around us and it's so fast-paced and there's so much stuff going on around us. Sometimes it's good just to stand and listen and to yield to him and to be reminded, God is good. I am blessed. Even in the chaos around me, I am blessed. Because we can easily look at these passages and think like, well, you know, blessings are, 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 are only for these individuals. And it makes us kind of feel bad sometimes. And then sometimes what we do with that is we compare those things to what we do have or we compare them to what we don't have and then we, we feel down about ourselves. And that's not what God's intending with this psalm. And again, we have to remember that that ultimate blessing that we have is in Christ. 
that's where we find those blessings, and that's where we can be content with what we do have versus looking at what we don't have. To find that enjoyment in the life that the Lord has already provided for us. Again, I'm not going to pretend it's easy to do that, but that is exactly what the Lord wants for us. In the bulletin outlines, I, I hinted at it earlier, I left a little bit of room for you to write down some things that, that you are blessed with. What are some of those things in your life that you have been blessed with, that you find that gratitude in? And I want you just to take a couple moments to, to write some things down. I'll give you a few minutes to do that. And if you have time before I, I close our time in prayer, go ahead and pray over those things yourself and just give them thanksgiving and gratitude for what you have in him and what he's already provided for you. And I think this is something that we should probably do every once in a while. And I think this is something we should do and, and remember and even remind our families a little bit of what we do have and how blessed they are. Because sometimes we don't see that in our own, in our own right. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that, then we'll close our time in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, you do give us so many blessings in our lives, and I think the wise children this morning said it very well. Sometimes we just take for granted those things that you give to us and those things that we have because of you. And I think a lot of times, too, we just assume and believe that it's because of our own abilities, but everything we have is a gift from you. So I pray, God, for each and everybody here, especially those who are struggling with something Give them the comfort and the confidence they need today. And so as they leave this room and as they go through their weeks, that they remember, Father, that that's where you have them in that moment. And for them to stop and pause and yield and, 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 and just to look at the blessings they do have as a reminder, Father, of, hey, this is where I need to keep my focus. Help us to do that when we have times of, of doubt, fear, anger, frustration, anxiety, sadness, the list can go on and on. Help us in those moments, Father, to just remember you, to remember what you have given, and to remember the sacrifice that you gave in your son so we can have those blessings. Help us to walk in your ways. Help us to have that type of fear that causes us to, to bow down to you. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.